Matthew chapter 14. Shall we stand together for the reading of God's word? Indeed, God's hand does hold us fast. In Matthew 21 of chapter 14, chapter 14, verse 21, 22, I'm pardon, verse 22. Immediately, our Lord made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, and they said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. Let us pray together. We want to thank you, our Father, so much for your strong hand that does take hold of us and you keep us. And Lord, as we look at your word this morning, as we contemplate your disciples on that stormy sea and how you rescued them, we also, Lord, need your help. For many of us are facing trials, the trials of life, the storms of life. And our, our life raft is about to sink and overturn. And so we need your help. We need to have faith to trust in you in all the difficult times of life. We ask of you that. Take your word, open it to us, apply it to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you and I continue our study of the Gospel of Matthew, we're in the 14th chapter. Last time we spoke about this chapter, we saw the feeding of the 5,000 and the great marvelous miracle that God performed as he fed 5,000 men besides women and children with a boy's lunch. Along the same time, there was a companion miracle that followed immediately after that. There was a particular miracle that was experienced by the disciples the 12 disciples who were by trade fishermen and they were commanded by the Lord to get into the boat and go across to another city called Bethsaida where he would meet them later on and continue their ministry. And it's in the midst of this departure as they made their way to the next city that a storm, a storm ensued and gave opportunity for the Lord once again to work another miracle the miracle of the walking on the water, a powerful demonstration of the great power of God and the person of God. Now, the Lord's miracles had purpose for them. Now, where Jesus made many miracles. He worked miracles all the time. He was healing here and making people to see, etc., making many miracles. But some miracles had a particular purpose to them. The particular purpose was to authenticate him authenticate his own messiahship, that he was truly the son of God. And, the, and, and subsequent to that, alongside of that, the purpose of miracles was always to create faith, engender faith in his disciples. And so as you and I look at this miracle here of the walking in the water, understand the two full purposes are revealed here. The two reasons why Jesus worked miracles are revealed here. First of all, to prove that he is God in the flesh. 
that he's just, just not an ordinary, ordinary man. He was more than that. He was God in the flesh. He was the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important for us to understand that. We need, uh, we need that affirmation this morning. So as you and I understand this miracle, understand that he's showing here that he is truly the Son of God. When you look at, when you look at, the, at verse 33, verse 33 of our text, you'll notice that this is what took place. And those, those that were in the boat, they worshipped him saying, you are certainly what? You're certainly God's son. God goes out of his way. You might be here this morning and you don't have genuine faith in Christ. There are many today, even in America, with so much Christian teaching in our history. There are many that still think that Jesus Christ is just a man if he existed at all. And yet we have to understand that the Lord went out of his way to show you and to show me that he is God in the flesh. He is certainly God's son. And so he worked these miracles over and over again to convince us and to prove us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so this miracle was given foremost and first of all to all of us, but especially to you here this morning. If you don't, don't believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, the Son of God, then look at this miracle and verify that he truly is the very Son of God. He, when he worked this miracle, isn't just one, in one miracle. There are actually four miracles in one. Four miracles in one. You look at it carefully and you'll see, first of all, that Jesus walked on the water. Miracle number one. Miracle number two is that Peter walked on the water. Miracle number three is that when he got into the boat, the storm ceased at once. And miracle number four, recorded by John. But as soon as he got into the boat, the boat landed where they were going immediately. So this is a fourfold display of the power of God in one miracle. How much more evidence do you need? How much more proof do you need? It is here for you. So I would encourage you to look to God and to look to Christ and recognize them that he is, he came, God came to save you. And he came in the person of Jesus Christ, God's son, to give his life for you and for you also then to bow down and to worship him and to say truly you are the son of God the savior of the world the second purpose for the miracle is to create faith to help our faith and so in in this in this miracle they performed he is working on the 12 disciples to engender their faith to have their faith grow because you see their there's going to be storms in our lives like there were storms in their life. This great storm. There's going to be storms in your life and in my life. And we need to have the kind of faith that is going to help us to be able to weather these storms and go through these storms and make sure that we are depending upon Christ, our Savior, for Him, for His help in every dimension of life. So let's look at this miracle from this other perspective. It's designed designed to engender faith in our lives, to help us grow. Let me ask you a question. Do we need more faith? Do we need our faith strengthened? Or are you a super Christian already, able to face every up and down? Would you agree we all need faith? We all need to grow in faith. So let's let the Lord help us this morning to grow in our faith. I want to take you, first of all, to the Gospel of Mark chapter 6. Would you go to Mark chapter 6? This miracle is so powerful. It is such a marvelous miracle recorded by Matthew and by Mark and by John. It records the miracle of Jesus walking in the water. But in Mark chapter 6, Mark adds a dimension. Mark adds a thought that Matthew and John do not add that we need to stop and examine for just a moment because it has to do with faith. It has to do with our faith, their faith and also our faith. And you'll notice in Mark chapter 6, verses 51 and 52. Mark chapter 6, verses 51 and 52. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped. And they were utterly, what? Utterly astonished. They were like, wow, miracle. Utterly astonished. In verse 52, Mark adds and says, For they had not gained any insight 
from the incident of the loaves. But their heart was what? Hardened. So Mark adds, these people were so astonished because they, got, they had no insight from the loaves. That they learned nothing. They were the same ones that a few moments ago, a few moments ago, they were out there feeding 5,000 men besides women and children. They were watching, they were watching a miracle performed. A little boy's lunch feeding over 8,000 to 10,000 to 15,000 people. They saw that. And yet, when they went through the storm, they were like totally afraid, totally panicked. They were like on the verge of of drowning. These were experienced, most of them experienced fishermen. They had been in situations almost like this. And then, all of a sudden, a miracle is performed. The wind stopped. Jesus did it. And they were like, wow. It's as though though for the first time, they're, they're seeing Jesus in a different way. And then Mark adds, because their hearts were hardened, they they weren't getting it. They weren't getting it. Isn't it interesting? It interesting that that they're no different than we are. You know, we don't even get it sometimes. Well, you agree to that. You know, we don't get it. We just don't get it. I don't get it sometimes. You hear and you see and you read and you just don't get it. And, and we, we come to church, we read, we hear, we see, and we just don't what? We just don't get it. In other words, we are, we're also, as they say in Spanish, cabezones. We are also rather thick-headed, are we not? We don't always, it doesn't always penetrate our craniums. It isn't, it isn't as though we're, everything, everything that we hear sticks like Velcro. It doesn't. It falls off like jelly, you know what I'm saying? Like jello, just falls off our heads. And so here, here Mark, Mark says the reason why is that their hearts were hardened. Their hearts were hardened. Hardened in the sense that they were, that the word of God, the power of God did not penetrate. And so we need to recognize that our hearts become like that. Our hearts are very slow sometimes. Or they're thick. They're, they're not soft. They're not ready. And they become hardened. The word of God reminds us. Go to Hebrews chapter 3, please. Hebrews chapter 3 reminds us in the book of Hebrews, in the third chapter, that our, our hearts and our minds have a history of sin. And sin has had its impact in our lives. And so in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, here's what it says in the book of Hebrews. Take care, brethren. That there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today. So that none of you will be hardened by the what? By the deceitfulness of sin. Sin, my beloved, is what hardens our hearts. Sin hardens our hearts. It isn't just the young man that was baptized that says, you know, life is hard and I'm trying to grow. He speaks for all of us. He speaks for all of us. And the more you spend your time out there in sin, the harder your your heart becomes. Because sin has a tendency to deceive you. Sin is always deceiving you. When it deceives you, the result is going to be hardness of heart or insensitivity to God. The more you sin the harder it becomes. The more you indulge yourself in sin, the harder your life becomes. And so we're reminded of that. And these disciples, were, they were no exception. They, were, they, they had insensitive hearts. The truth of God was not penetrating. And that's why there was a need for miracle after miracle after miracle for God to do this. And so he's working on that. And recognize, my friends, that that can be us as well. Hardness of heart can also come because we fail to believe the things that God is speaking to us. Go drop down to verse, verse 19. Look at verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 3. And so we see that they were not able to enter because of what? Because of unbelief. There's always in all of us a resistance to the truth, resistance to what God is saying to us. That's unbelief. And unbelief can become, can become a a, 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 
a, a cause of the hardness of our hearts. You and I reject, we reject, we reject. After a while, there is hardness of heart. Some of you gentlemen here are, you work with your hands. You work with your hands. I mean, not in the computer. You work with your hands elsewhere, perhaps digging, perhaps building and construction. We can tell by your hands that you have, you have worked hard because after a while, you develop a calloused, a calloused hand. And so the calloused hand is a hand that has been, been at the forefront in the beginning. You develop blisters. Your skin was soft. It hurt. But over and over again, callus is developed. All of a sudden, there's an insensitivity as you work. You don't get calluses. It doesn't bother you. Why? Because your skin has developed a, a hardness, a hardness about it. And so it is with our hearts. The more we reject God, the more we resist the truth, the harder your heart becomes. I heard the other day of a, of a person that was talking to a believer. They had met a long time ago, long time ago, and this person had been a, a positive influence on this believer and had given the person some advice. And now many, many years, decades later, they asked him again, so how are you doing? He says, this is my God. And he rolled up his sleeve and he had 666 written, tattooed on his arm. This is my God, the Antichrist. Wow. What happened? Rejection of truth. Rejection of truth. And so we need to be careful, friend. Don't, don't dilly-dally with God's truth. Don't play loose with it. Develop a great sensitivity to God. A great sensitivity. Oh, we are slow learners, but be learners. We are thick-headed, but soften the thick head. And be sensitive to God as he speaks to us. So Mark tells us. Mark says, I had to work this miracle for your sake. To soften your hearts. And let you see that I am truly, truly the savior of the world and able to help you. Now follow me back to Mark, Mark, Matthew chapter 14. There's another expression of, of the need for why you and I need to grow in our faith. And that has to do with the with the outstanding miracle that he performs with Ma on Matthew. On Matthew. People of God, remember that this miracle is found in Matthew, Mark, and John, but only Matthew records what, what Jesus did to Simon Peter. Simon Peter. You see, he had a lesson for Simon Peter. And when Simon Peter asked for help, in verse 31, verse 31 of, of Matthew 14, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him, and then he said to him, you great man of God. Is that what he said? <laughs> what do you say? Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Now, let's not be too hard on, too hard on, uh, on Simon Peter, okay? How's your faith? Are you a man of great faith or a man of little faith? Are we a woman of great faith or are we a woman of little faith? See, this is, he realized that this man, Peter, was a man of little faith. And so this, this miracle was designed to help this man grow in faith. He already had a measure of faith, but he needed to grow in faith. Because you see, there are storms of life come, and we need to have the kind of faith that is able to face the storms of life. And so the Lord is working on the Apostle Peter to have him who is of little faith to grow in faith. And this miracle was designed to do that, to help him grow in faith. We need, we need to be honest with God. We need to confess to him if we are people of little faith, then we need to ask the Lord, Lord, I am a person of little faith, help me then. Help me in my unbelief. Help me to grow in my faith. And in this, in this incident here, you will see how our Lord is helping Peter to grow in faith. For his faith to grow, to grow in measure, to grow ever, ever greater in every episode of life. So let's see how it is. How it is that God helps our faith to grow. And there are four, 
four steps that he gives to Peter that also the four steps that are ours as well if we're to grow in faith. How does faith grow? Well, faith grows, first of all, by you and I listening to God, by hearing God's word. Faith grows as we hear God's word. It is interesting. It is interesting. Go to verse 27. Verse 27. These disciples are terribly frightened. They, they're fearful not only of the storms, but they also misinterpreted when Jesus was walking in the water. They thought it was a ghost. It was a phantom. And so they cried out in fear. Verse 27, immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I. Do not be what? Do not be afraid. They're the Lord's word. Faith comes as you and I hear and, and listen to God's word. Go to Romans 10. Romans 10 with me. In Romans 10, verse 17, here is what the Lord says through the apostle Paul. Romans 10 and verse 17. Are we there? So faith, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the what? By the word of Christ. As you and I respond to God's word, as you and I read God's word, as you and I hear God's promises, as you and I hear his, his words to us, our faith is going to grow. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. It doesn't just happen. We come as we listen to God's word. And so reminds us here. Reminds us here that faith comes. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. It is interesting that Peter says to Jesus, now how do I know it's you? How do I know it's you? As far as I'm concerned, you're a phantom. It's a ghost walking in the water. If it's really you, then ask me to come out to you. And Jesus says what? Come, come. And what does Peter do? What does Peter do? He goes, now notice, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When God speaks, we obey. We obey. And that's how faith comes. He came, he comes. And so as God speaks to us, as the word of God is given to us, as we read it, as we hear what he says, as we hear his promises, his comforts, his encouragement, our faith is going to grow. We are going to have shallow faith that we have shallow understanding of God's word. You're going to have great faith when you have a deep understanding of God's word. When you be like the apostle Peter said to us, because he himself then gives advice on faith in his epistles. He says, like newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. And he would add in a footnote, I learned that by experience when I had to walk on the water. You see, and so it is by means of the word. People today, let me encourage you. Your storms are gonna come. They're gonna, it's just a matter, not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And unless you have this kind of faith, the faith that we're speaking about, you're gonna be blown away by these storms of life. So let's make it a point as you and I think of increasing our faith to take more of his word into our lives. Not just to read it, but to believe in it and to what? Obey it. So it's important for us to recognize that. Let's go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 14. There's a different, there's another step that it takes for us to increase our faith. And that is by, by the experiences. And Peter's an example of that. He asked the Lord for a word and he gave him to him. He said, come. And so Peter then obeyed him and he came out. Experiences. You and I are going to grow in faith as you and I experience God at work. God at work. Peter was always, he had already been at the feeding of the 5,000. He already had seen Jesus at work. He was with them. That's why Jesus said to the 12, follow me and I'll show you how to become fishers of men. Just see what I do. See how I operate. Follow me. And you're going to learn to do the same thing. Experiences. We are going to grow as we experience God. So Jesus said to Peter, come. And what did Peter do? He came. Peter walked on water. Now some of us give Peter a bad rap. 
We, 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 we only look at the fact that he started to sink. We only look at the fact that he, you know, lost, took his eyes off Jesus, put him on the water, and he began to sink. No friend, understand this, that Peter literally walked on water. When was the last time you walked on water? When was it? Hmm? None of us. He did. He said, you don't laugh at me. How about you? See, your experiences come when you take God at his word and you start living out for him. When you begin to live out your life for God, you're going to begin to see your faith begin to grow. It grows by you trusting God. You trust in God. And people, listen to me. You're trusting God, not necessarily for the big things. You're asking for a big miracle, for the big walking on water, for the feeding of the 5,000, for the raising of the dead, for those types of things. Let me, let me assure you, that is not going to be the way the rank and file of us are going to grow in faith. We're going to grow in faith by trusting him every single day of our lives, by the little things that he does for us. As you and I trust him on a regular basis, your faith begins to grow. Your faith begins to grow. It's those steps that we take of walking with Jesus in the course of my life. And I can look back on my life and I can't see great outstanding miracles that God performed in my life. I don't have a list of them. I can't say these are the great miracles that God did. I, I, can't, I can't point to that. But I can point to a, 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 a huge list of all the little things that God has done in my life. Day in and day out. Where God has been with me through circumstances and issues. Where little by little my faith began to grow. And it grew and it grew and it grew as I simply learned to walk with God. That's the way it's going to be with you. If you're not walking with God, your faith is not going to grow. If you're not taking it on a daily basis and just say, Lord, help me through this day. And then watch as you walk with him, as you commune with him, as, he, as he's there for you along the way. You begin to see the hand of God. You begin to trust him. You have to take your step, put it out. I'm sure that when Peter stepped out of the boat, he didn't just kind of jump out. Huh? I don't think he probably put it out gently and then... And then began to, yes or no, began to test it. And then as he began to walk. That's the way faith grows. You take it a step at a time and you walk with him. Some of you do not. Some of you don't walk with God. You simply live your life the way you want to live it. You think of God maybe every now and then. Maybe even once a week. Instead of once a day. Or more than once a day throughout the day. Just trust in God. Experience will be the way that you're going to grow with God. And that's why the apostle who wrote in the book of Hebrews in the fifth chapter reminds us of that. When he talked about you are slow, you're slow of heart. You're going to grow as you put the word of God into practice in your life. Then you're going to grow and you're going to become mature in your faith. Notice also that faith grows. Faith grows not only by the word of God, not only by experiences, but faith also grows through trials. This, this storm was not by accident. This storm was planned. It was planned. It was designed to teach these disciples faith. It was a major trial. Now you need to understand that this storm was an unusual storm. It was a great storm in the Sea of Galilee. So it's one of these rare issues where you have a lake the size of the Sea of Galilee... There at the foot of Mount Hermon, where the, the cold breeze comes down and all of a sudden huge winds and huge waves in such a small lake. And they become really dangerous things. This was an unusual storm, not, not the kind they're accustomed to. And now these, these men are trained fishermen. This is Peter and Andrew, James and John, who owned a fishing company on the Sea of Galilee. These are men trained in the art of fishing and boating. They were panicked. That's a great storm. But it was designed, it's designed by God to engender, to, to teach faith, to allow these men to grow in their faith. People of God, it's necessary for us to go through trials. They're essential for our faith to grow. 
Let me show you. Go to Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, the, the apostle here in, in, in praising God for his salvation, the peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, but reminds us, reminds us in verse 3, Romans 5, 3, and not only this, but we also exult, we rejoice in our what? Tribulations, our trials, knowing that tribulations brings about what? Perseverance. And perseverance brings about proven character. And proven character brings about what? Hope. And hope does not what? Disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hallelujah for trials. Go to James 1. Go to James chapter 1. In the book of James chapter 1, James begins his marvelous epistle by reminding us of the value of trials. James chapter 1 and verse 2. Are you there? James 1 and verse 2. Consider it all what? Joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be what? Perfect and complete, lacking in what? Nothing. Trials are essential for that. When you get a trial, do you say, hallelujah, praise God, a trial? Is that what you do? Come on, talk to me, hypocrite. Talk to me now. You know, you groan, you complain. Why me? Why me, God? Well, because you need more faith. You need more faith. And the only way you're going to get more faith is by means of trials. Trials strengthen you. So we're in a culture today where we don't want anybody to suffer. We want to we minimize all manner of suffering. We're raising a bunch, of, a bunch of young people, a bunch of kids who are totally, totally just doughboys. Just plastic. No, no strength, nothing. No endurance because we shield them from every conceivable trial. We don't want them to suffer anything. I don't want my kids to suffer the way I suffered. Shut up. You are what you are today because you suffered. Let them suffer too. Trials are necessary. They're important. God knows that. For us to live in this world uh, where, where sin is rampant, where, where everything is in flux, where climate change is not new to God. It's not new to God. Nothing is new to God. We are in this planet and we need to be strong and our faith needs to be strong. We need to go through trials. We in California, we boast about our giant redwoods up in, up in central California in the high Sierras. These beautiful, gorgeous trees that are some, some of them a thousand years old. A thousand years old. But for them to endure a thousand years, they have to go through fire. They need fire. They need a forest fire to burn through them every now and then. It's through the four fires that they are able then to, their seeds sprout by means of fire. If there is no fire, the seeds don't sprout. And the seeds don't sprout, they don't reproduce themselves. It's part of God's plan for these trees. It's God, God's plan for you and for me also. To have trials and endure these trials. Speak to me now. You see, and right now you may be going through a trial. And you're saying, God, why me? He says, why not, honey? Why not, sweetheart? Why not, sir? I want you to grow in your faith. And it's by the means of your trial that you develop a type of faith that is able to lean on God. Lean on God. Listen, to people. The only time some of us ever lean on God is when you're flat on your back. And that's why God puts you flat on your back, so that you lean on God. The only time we ever think about God is when we are at our wit's end, when we've lost every, every strength we have, and God is all we have. That's where God wants you to be. Aha! I got you where I need you to be, where I am everything to you, and you must depend upon me. And so it is. And so it is. When Peter was in this problem, when he was in this jam, and he, he started to sink, he didn't say, James, throw me a life raft. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't say that. He said, Jesus, what? Save me. Lord, save me. In other words, you, you need to. You need to. You need to 
by trials, focus and put your faith, put your eyes on Christ. The only mistake Peter made was that he took his eyes off the Lord and put them on the wind. That was his mistake. He took his eyes off the Lord. The, the text says it. Took his eyes off the Lord and put him on the wind, and then he began to sink. Always keep your eyes where? On the Lord. On the Lord. Look to him. Look to him. The apostle in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, as he finished the great chapter of, of the book of Hebrews, the faith chapter, the 11th chapter, and then he says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Fix your eyes the way they did on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Faith comes as you and I go through trials. And then add one more. Not only the word, not only experience, not only trials, but prayer. Prayer is how you and I grow in faith. And Peter had to exercise prayer. He began to sink. And then he prayed. He prayed to the Lord. Lord, save me. And Jesus stretched out his hand and what? And took hold of him and saved him. Prayer is how you and I are going to grow in faith. As you're going back to this personal relationship. We need God, we pray, answers prayer. And when you serve a God that answers prayer, all of a sudden everything changes, friend. Now your faith, now you're tapped in. You're tapped into the power of God through prayer. Now you have a connection with God through prayer. Now you can depend upon God for prayer. So whatever trial, whatever affliction, whatever issue God takes you to, you know that prayer is there for you. Prayer is there for you. And so it's prayer that is going to help you to increase your faith. You can begin to write down all the times that you've prayed and God has answered your prayer. The psalmist says, the psalmist says in Psalm 34, this man cried out and the Lord what? Heard him. The Lord answered him. This poor man cried out, and the Lord answered him. And so, friend, if our faith is going to grow, it'll grow as you and I, as you and I lean on God as we pray to him and as we turn to him. Learn to pray and have your faith begin to grow. Oh, ye of little faith, Jesus said to Peter. He could have said that any one of us here this morning. Oh, ye of little faith. And so, my dear friend, People of God, family of faith, let's grow in our faith. Let's let the Lord in, increase our faith. Will trials come in our lives? Yes. Not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But strong faith will be able to face these trials and face them in a marvelous, marvelous way. Notice, friend, that Jesus, Peter cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. That is the That is the cry of every soul that needs to go to heaven, that wants to go to heaven. If you're lost, if you're here and you don't know if you're going to heaven, if you're here and you are not a real born-again Christian, if you're here and you don't have uh, the assurance that heaven is yours, this is a cry that you need to give to Jesus. Lord, save me. Lord, save me because only he can save you. You can't save yourself. No one else can save you. Only Jesus can save you. And so if you're here this morning, you've never cried out to Jesus. You've never asked him for salvation. Let me encourage you. Let me urge you to do it today and have Christ become your Lord and Savior. This is the first prayer and the most important prayer you will ever give is to have Jesus save your soul from hell, apply his blood to your sins, and then, and then, be able to save you from hell and take you to heaven. That's his promise to you. And I would urge you, if you've never done that, for you to do that and to do it today. Let us pray together this morning. Our Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for touching our lives today. Lord, you nailed us carefully. You nailed us, O ye of little faith. And we are, all of us here, myself included. So we sit at your feet this morning confessing our need to grow and we want to thank you thank you for showing us how we can grow in our faith our father we also 
We also pray for those in our audience that may not know Jesus. Lord, speak to their hearts. Show them that they're lost, that they don't have a relationship with you, and they need to have that. And may right now as they bow their heads, may they cry out to you, Lord Jesus, save me. Save me from my sins. Forgive me. Forgive me. Make me a child of God. Lord, do it today. That's our prayer for them, Lord. And we also thank you. Thank you for speaking to us. Now pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.